Why would a mobile phone have an agenda to go around committing murders? Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. This is episode 172. Thank you so much for checking us out. I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek. And before we get started with the movie discussion tonight, we must go around and meet the fellow bros. We start with the American hero, Nate Thurmond. Nate, how early on a Sunday is too early for your neighbor to mow their lawn? Um, I mean, that all depends on what kind of night I had the night before. But, um, <laughs> I mean, th- yeah, they shouldn't they shouldn't be starting that shit before like 9 a.m. Or we're going to go outside and have a problem. It's like who are you trying to impress doing it at like 8.15, you know? Yeah, no one cares. It's we're so all fucking hot, though. That is true. I know, but that, like, I think nine is reasonable. If you wake me up though before nine on a Sunday because you had to start your mower, like, we need to have a discussion. Yeah, why are you not at church? I mean, I'm I mean, still gonna be in bed, but right. But, but why, why are you not you, at church? You right. I'm not going to church, but I'm gonna put my gonna put my white wig on and judge you. <laughs> yeah, this isn't about me. Don't spin this. Like what? Uh, that voice you heard is the mad scientist Brian Banner, where we go into the lab next. Banner, what's the best chemical concoction to mix with whiskey, in your opinion? Uh, ice. Ah, yes. Well, H2O. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's exactly what I have. I have two frozen H2O cubes and... A lot of whiskey. Those are big ass ice cubes. H H two O two. Yeah, they are big ice cubes. They're like, I think, I don't know. They're yeah, they're fucking big. Do either of you have those? Uh, one of the ice things where you can just make like one gigantic like ball of ice. I do. I, I haven't used it in a while, but yeah. The whiskey That's, ball, isn't that what? It's yeah, called? the whiskey ball. That's so classy. Yeah, it's funny because like you like put like the top silicone part on and you fill it up. But like most of the time you pull it off, like the hole you fill the water up, there's like a little nipple on top. So it look like mm. looks like a boob, so that's fun. Probably not an accident. <laughs> no. Def- a man definitely created that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here on the Bro Four Squad podcast, we start every episode off with the most important thing in any bro's life, and that is chest day. And our chest day topic today, we did this a few episodes ago, one of my favorite types of chest day because, number one, we usually have zero prep, although, spoiler alert, I kind of cheated for Nate's uh, chest day today. But two, we never know uh, what the other bros are going to do, and that is a basically chest day du jour, where each bro brings something they would like to talk about, movie or TV related. It can be a news item, uh, something they've watched recently that they think could spur bigger discussion, uh, or I believe when Cycle's on, he had some stories that he had read from sets of previous films that came out. So literally we... whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. a safe space. Uh, so, Banner, why don't we start with you? What is your chest day today or what do you I guess need to get off your chest regarding movies that maybe we can help you out with? So uh, I was scrolling through some stuff today and I saw an article that they announced that we are going to have a host for the Academy Awards this year, which is the first time since, I believe, 2018. And I just want to know your guys' thoughts. Do we do we like a solo host? Do we like the medley of, of people with no true host? Or should Oscar just post the winners on Instagram and let's move on down the road? Um, I, I saw that same thing. I can't remember where I saw it posted, but it, it literally put me down a rabbit hole today of watching several of Ricky Gervais's I was about to say uh, guy yeah. him. Gold, golden globes and like it just was like a compilation of like his opening monologue and then like him in between oh my god those are fucking hilarious so I mean if they get if they get him back well I mean it would be a, a different award show but he'd be, he'd be um, crossing the picket line he would he would be crossing the picket line a little bit um, would he be the only person to ever host both Mm, great question don't know the answer to it not gonna do the research to look it up but that is a great question no um, comment below for us please and and really this is kind of pointed but um in unless you're gonna be like him they can go hostless i mean they've got the people in yeah. between it it moves the show along just fine but i would love to laugh at inappropriate humor like he puts out there the thing about him which it's it's also crazy that he's done it i think 
he's done the globes at least two or three times. I, was gonna say, I think he's done them like I was thinking four or five. But yeah. it's crazy because he does not give a fuck about being a part of Hollywood. So he will just say what like he's not trying to work for any of these directors. He's not trying to hire any of these actors. <laughs> So he'll go after anybody, and that's what makes him so dangerous. Is everyone in the audience is like, dude, this guy doesn't give a he does not give a shit. In fact, he probably wants you to kick him out in the middle of the monologue. Yeah, come up here, accept your little award, thank your God, <laughs> and fuck off. Thank your God. <laughs> um, is he the one who made the joke where there's the Jonah Hill meme of him like kind of cutting his throat, like, dude, don't say that. That sounds right. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I know. I know for sure because this was on one of the compilations I watch. It's where you get the uh, Tom Hanks meme where he's like looking down to the side and like, oh, oh my shoot. god, <laughs> yeah, that comes from one of his. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, so Kimmel hosted an eight. Host. Kimmel hosted an eighteen. Sorry to cut you off, Banner, but good. I uh, even with COVID, I cannot believe it's been that long since we had an actual host because I don't remember his hosting at all, really. Hit, the last time there was somebody won like a jet ski or some shit, that was the last one he hosted. I remember that. Like I actually kind of liked the format without a host, right? They would announce presenters who would come out and they would just hand off the award. And, and I think it moved faster, to be honest. It felt like it did. And it's, I think that like the opening monologue, they replace it with like a musical act. Like I think uh, Justin Timberlake did it one year. That's right. Um, so both of both of you guys are going no host, right? I say no host. Uh, do you think without a host we could get this thing at the two hour mark? I think to get it at the two hour mark, they should just post it on Instagram. I'm I'm over I'm over the fucking Oscars guys. I am too. The Broscars are the quintessential award show. Obviously. Yep. Uh, let just... me ask you this. You remember that? I think it was now like five years ago they talked about this, but they were going to introduce a popular film award. Quote yeah, unquote. whatever happened to that? Yeah, because that's the one that I would give a fuck about. That's the movies we people actually see. That you don't need to be invited to like the Cannes Film Festival to view it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you live and you learn. So we all go no host? I go no fucking show, but yeah, no host. Yeah, yeah no you. host. Um, I guess I'll go next because, Banner, that actually ties perfectly into mine. Wow. As a it's like we, we didn't even plan this. I know. Now no one it's off like the top. It's like we finish each other's sandwiches. Yes. I got cool. you. Uh, so the 79th annual Golden Globes happened, kind of. Uh, <laughs> and this was interesting to me because they, according to several outlets – uh, the Golden Globes have kind of always been, leading back to Gervais, regarded as like the trashier award show. Like it doesn't really matter. It's people are like, well, it's kind of a precursor. Like if you do well at the Globes, you usually might do well at the Oscars. But this is the award show where like celebrities will show up, just get shit faced. They don't really care about the award. And if you're an actor or actress and you're like, I've actually won a Golden Globe, people are like, okay, <laughs> neat. Like, and. That's fun. Um, so the Golden Globes this year uh, canceled their televised award show uh, because they were unable to get anyone to come and present. No one had their, their talent booking said that no one had returned their calls. So this became an issue of do we do the show with some weird format we're not prepared to do? Uh, and they decided to just announce their winners overall. So. I pulled up the the winners of this award show, and I guess the first thing I'll ask is this before I read these. Nate, we can go to you first. If this is the case, even considering, again, it's a we're in the middle of a two-year pandemic and our pets' heads are falling off, but if you're the Golden Globes and this happens, I understand next year would be your 80th annual. That's a cool fucking round number to reach. But at this point, do we have to just say, dude, this thing's done? Or do you think they can salvage it? I think they can salvage it, but to that point, <clears throat> next year, do they actually say it's the 80th? Like I was this, just about to ask that. Did the 79th actually have, like, oh, the 79th Golden Globe Awards? I'm like, 
Yeah, but did I mean sure you voted like someone voted somewhere and votes were tallied and okay they have winners but mm, you might have to wait two years for eighty in my in my mind <laughs> I don't know if they they might try and capitalize on it like eightieth I'm like no I'm sorry this is the seventy ninth <laughs> I wish we had a soundboard because I would cue up the Akon quote from the song I just had sex where he goes still counts still counts. Still counts. <laughs> It's kind of like if the if a forest if a tree falls in the forest like if the Golden Globes happen but they didn't really happen did they happen? Did anyone even notice? Yeah, probably not. It, uh, no, but I I think it can be can be salvaged. Like I mean, yeah, I think enough people wants people feel comfortable getting out there, and if that's the reason, that's it's kind of shitty that no one was returning their their invites. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's just a good excuse for celebrities to go out, get drunk, and have a good time, and. I'm, I'm sure there will there will be plenty to participate once things get a little bit back to normal. Yeah, this used to it, it, it's definitely f- closer to the Oscars than like the MTV Movie Awards, but it used to kind of be like a fun middle ground award show where it was like you you could get big names to go, but no one really took it seriously. It was like an interesting yeah dynamic. Brian, what do you think? Is this thing done, or can we somehow get it on life support again next year? I think. I don't know. I personally, I'm just over all of the uh, award shows. They're just, they're very, they are what they are. We'll just leave it at that. We're not a, we're not that kind of podcast. So I'm just kind of over everybody kind of pushing their agenda at these award shows. Uh, I'm okay with them just dropping them. I, I do think that we have to have some sort of award or some sort of recognition of in this calendar year, this was the top of whatever uh, category. I think that the people that make these movies deserve that. Um, With that being said, yeah, they're going to, they're going to do something to keep this thing alive. Um, Like, I think it would be cool if they did. I mean, similar style where they, they feed them dinner and just get them fucking shit faced, but uh, do make it to where it's like fun. Yeah. Well, know. and that's the thing. I know it, it ebbs and flows each year. Like the reason we invented the Broskers, which will be dropping in February, we use it to challenge the Academy Awards, basically, because we do way better ratings than them. Obviously. But the reason we came up with it was because we felt like the Oscars over the course of like a half decade to a decade had gotten so inaccessible and snooty. Like when films like The Artist and again, no offense to these movies, but it's definitely not like the accessible fare that people see, but like Roma and the artist, things like that were starting to win. I was like, maybe because I see a hundred movies a year and none of this shit is like really down my alley. Then we have a year, a few years ago where like parasite comes out and it was way off my radar, but we all watched it. I know Nate did as well and fucking loved it. So it's like, I guess it is a year to year thing, but overall, like I can, if I think back to the past decade of my life, I'm kind of with you, Brian. I'm like, I don't really need the award shows. I'd like a movie to get recognized each year, but I feel like at least half of the time it's a film that if I watched, I'd be like, dude, what the fuck? Avengers Endgame was just way better than this. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, in, in my opinion, what makes a good movie, and we're going to get off on a tangent here, but it's something that entertains you. Those movies make me think too much, so I'm not very entertained. Not to say they're not good, but I, I want to be entertained. That's why my top 100 movies is – such a fucking mess has jumanji on it and no not the robin williams one and that's fine that is fine yeah i think i like both i like a movie that makes me think and wants to talk with my friends and i also like a movie where godzilla fights king kong on an aircraft carrier and i'm three beers deep when i watch it (laughs) (laughs) uh and i think that i just think the problem with the academy awards is number one uh, the diversity issues is obviously a huge deal is what's kept them from really expanding and growing but they also just haven't adapted to the times like filmmaking has changed dramatically and whether martin scorsese agrees with it or not like the marvel movies are still good movies just because he's not making them and they don't look like the departed or uh the irishman you know true all right real quick i just want to read through some of these winners uh, only like the main awards from the golden globes um so nate you might be pleased or displeased because i know you your review was a little bit polarizing of what won best motion picture for drama. And that was the power of the dog on Netflix. Yeah, I could see that. And yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those that you were kind of describing it. 
makes you think a little bit. Um, acting was decent in it. Um, I like the way it ended though. Um, so it left a decent taste in my mouth because of the way it ended. Um, but I, I definitely don't scoff at that. I, I think it's kind of deserving. Now, let me say this, and I think this was kind of happening. I can't remember the name of the movie, but Idris Elba did a movie where he played like a, an African warlord that was only on Netflix like five or six years ago that was nominated for Best Picture. But one thing the pandemic has done, and I think this will never go back uh, to the way it was even after it's over, but the streaming service movies now, like Power of the Dog and Netflix Original, are just as viable as a contender as anything released in theaters, which I think is good. Mm-hmm. Well, what no, is it? Two yeah. or three years ago, Manchester by the Sea, that was an Amazon original. Yeah, that's right. And that got some love. Because um, looking at what else was nominated for Best Picture, King Richard, which was an HBO Max release, and then Dune was actually nominated, which to me is sort of a you know a science fiction type movie that we don't typically see get nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. It's like Lord of the Rings. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of weird seeing that one up there for <laughs> nominations, but I agree. I thought it was a it's, great film. It's deserving of it, I think. Yeah. I think that one, the source material is so popular as well that had to help bolster it a little, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's very well revered. Um, Nate, also uh, best director to a motion picture, went to Jane Campione for Power of the Dog. Only, And she beat out Spielberg for West Side Story, Denis Villeneuve for Dune, and Kenneth Branagh did a movie called Belfast, which I didn't know came out. So... She beat some big fucking uh, like heavy hitters on this one. Yeah, yeah. I might at some point go back and rewatch that and see if I come away in a different light. Had to keep beating the same dead horse, but <laughs> best supporting actor was Cody Smith McPhee from Power of the Dog, who looks like the the kid, not the kid, but like the teenager. Uh, I thought he did a really good job. Um, and honestly, I may have talked about this when I talked about it on the pod, but yeah, I don't know Benedict Cumberbatch for some reason. Maybe it's because he was trying to do like a Western accent. It was just I was not feeling it. Mm-hmm. And like I felt like it kind of went in and out a little bit. Um, but I don't know. He, he just did not sell me on the role of like a, a rancher. So, yeah, he can do pretty much anything. But he does so many different accents that sometimes I worry we're going to have a Sophie Turner situation where it like slips. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, threw up in my mouth a little. Succession cleaned up. I haven't checked out that show yet. I know everyone and their dog is telling me I need to. Last thing I'll mention, though, best performance by an actor in a TV series, musical, or comedy. I was glad to see Jason Sudeikis won for Ted Lasso, which is a show that I fell in love with this year. So all in all, um, again, Golden Globes, we could probably take it or leave it. I would say if you had to put the percentage chance of them having a show next year, Nate, what would you say? I'd pre- I'd say probably like eighty percent. Yeah, I was gonna say like eighty five, right at that. Banner. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of it uh, will have to do with what's going on with COVID. If we have another surge or or whatever, um, but yeah, I think it's it's high eighties, ninety percent. I mean, they're gonna have one unless something crazy happens. Yeah. All right, that's all I got, Nate. What is uh, on your chest? Um, so through some recent text conversations, uh, talking about TV shows and everything, thought thought I'd go ahead and throw up my top three TV shows from 2021, since we're just now kicking off the new year. Um, so thought it'd be a good time to review those, talk those out. Um, and these are all shows that came out. In 2021, right? Because I watched a couple old series. I just wanted to clarify. Correct. Yes. All new series in 2021. Um, Two of these being anthology, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and one of them not. Um, But actually, I think – I don't know if all three of these would be in your top three, Jeff, but I I think you've seen all these actually. But um, We'll start off at number three, and this one was one that – kind of made me t- take a minute to mull it over, soak it in and everything. But after reflection over a couple months and everything, this happens a lot. Like I'll end up like, mm, I don't know how I feel about that. And I start thinking like, actually, I did like it. I like the characters, blah, blah, blah. But The White Lotus. That's my number three. <laughs> oh, really? 
Yeah. God damn it. Are we going to have the exact same list? Jeez. That If your number two is my number two, which I wouldn't I think it is. put it past you. Motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, the White Lotus. Um, so and yeah, you and I watched this. This is fun because you and I would watch this like week to week. Like we'd each watch yeah. the Wednesday episode with our wives and then talk about it right afterwards. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the more I think about it, I mean, I like the characters in it. It, it was like right in my wheelhouse like, with like a dark comedy um steve zahn was great in it um not everyone had a great character arc but you don't need that to have a have a great show um i think i've kind of settled and um accepted the fact that the bigger meaning behind this is kind of that you go on vacation come back and some things just don't change i mean that's real life right Uh, and so that's not to spoil anything um for people who haven't seen it but um that's kind of one of the big themes at the end of the day um but some of the characters did have some some good meaningful um, development in their character arc. Like Steve Zahn, his son had had a good one. Um, but it had a good mix of good people, shitty people, um, and overall, I, I think it just had a nice journey. It was nice and compact. It's in one area you can keep track. Um, but yeah, overall, as I reflect on it, it ranks in at number three. I really really enjoyed it. I think it just had like a very it was just very unique and it it made you like kind of uneasy but also you had a lot of fun with it it wasn't like uncomfortable mm-hmm. and i think murray bartlett who played armand might be my like top 3 favorite character in anything i saw this year yeah this is so great <laughs> the how, how he could flip the switch as the hotel <laughs> concierge or manager for like a better words um, and just hating people behind their backs and just turning on the big smile and say, oh, how are you doing today, sir? Can I get you anything? Of course so we'll you, do that. Yes. That's – yeah, that's one of the great roles I like to see in, in movies. It's funny to see the back and forth in that. And uh, again, the ending, I think I'm with you, man. I did – I wasn't a huge fan at first. Mm-hmm. The more it sat with me, I kind of appreciate. Yeah. It was like, oh, you think it's going to end this way? Well – Hang on just one second. Yeah. So and so, yeah, I, like I said, I, I came to a realization that, well, it's, I mean, that's kind of how life is. I, I understand what the creator and director was going for for this, so I can respect that. Nice. Sorry. Both our number three is The White Lotus. Brian, what's yeah. your number three TV show of the year? My or number Smith, three, I say. Uh, it is the final season of Lost in Space. I don't think either one of you guys have uh, watched any of this. No, but I know there was some production issues, right, that delayed this from coming out for a while? Yes. Or filming, I guess? Yeah, there was. There was COVID hit, and then they had – I think they had a couple other things too. Uh, but it finally came out. This was just extremely satisfying. Something about this this uh, episode. The first season was really good. The second season kind of dropped off. This third season kind of brought us back home to where we were in the first season, and then just – wrapped it in a nice little bow. Um, it was just a really good, really good season of, of uh, television. They told, yeah, they told a good story. I don't know much about this one. How many seasons are there? Three? Three. And I believe it's eight episodes a season. They're, they are like 50 minutes, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not a tough watch. I did enjoy... Uh... It's not a good movie, but the Matt LeBlanc Lost in Space movie. Oh, yeah. That's a good bad movie. <laughs> Gary <laughs> Oldman? Movie. Yeah, Gary Oldman is the villain in it. Uh, and uh, General Ross is in it too, right? Uh, I, be- is it- I believe so. Yeah. William Hurt? William yeah. Hurt, yeah. A young William Hurt. <clears throat> Handsome. My He's married, dude. Have- uh, yeah, so, yeah, Lost in Space Season 3. It, Like I said, it wasn't necessarily – because it was so crazy and the cinematography was great or whatever. It was just a really, really nice bow on top of a, of a short series. And does it end like this is the definitive ending or do they still try and tease some? And that's, this is very similar to the ending of Hawkeye where there are some strings that they can pull on for sure. But if they don't, I'm fine with that. Right. I think that, there's not any there's not any plans for an additional season though, is there? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Gotcha. Um all right, our number two, Nate, what's your number two favorite show of the year? I hope it's not mine, but I think it's 
<laughs> this would be amazing if it is because this is one you actually turned me on to. So okay, never mind then. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, diverse one through three. Um, number two is the animated series Invincible. That was my honorable mention. So it just okay, list. solid. Um, yeah, I was. I mean, I once uh, Horn suggested this to me, or I heard him say it probably middle last year, and then um finally got around to watching it yeah blew through in like a week um but very bingeable yeah yes very bingeable um can't wait for season two we'll try not spoil it for anyone out there who hasn't seen it um but i mean just robust cast for an animated series um pretty insane yeah yeah they really got some heavy hitting power in on this one uh jk simmons um idris elba uh, Mahershala Ali and Mahershala know. Ali, yeah, um, is in it. Um, and then uh, God, I'm blanking on the other Mark guy. Mark Hamill, Zazie Beetz, Sandra O oh from Grey's Anatomy. There's one other I'm thinking of. I don't. Seth have Rogen. I mean, that's enough right there. Uh, Walt Goggins. Oh yeah, he's great. Man. Walt Goggins, yeah, he's in that. Um, I always like him. So. Um, and I think we've said this on here. Jeff probably described this the way I did whenever I started watching it and mentioned it on, on the pod. But starts off slow and then just that last fucking five, ten minutes of the first episode fucking goes hard. Mm-hmm. And then from then on out, it's pretty much that way. Um, there's a great twist, I think probably the penultimate episode um, that kind of comes to culmination that's been building up throughout the whole season. Um it's a great twist. I, I love what they did with that. I won't spoil it or say it out loud for anyone. Even Banner, I know he doesn't care about spoilers, but this is once you get around to watching this, you'll want to you want to be surprised by this. Yeah, I'm actually in the market for something to watch, so yeah, uh, I, I may hop on this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, gritty animated superhero movie. Yeah, it ranked in at number two for me. I I loved it. And the thing about this show, a lot of times, like actors. Like J.K. Simmons is pro- – would you say he's the lead? I probably would, right? Uh, Yes. Mm-hmm. Even though Stephen Yun, who plays his son, actually is his invincible. Son, yeah. The namesake, yeah, of the show. But a lot of times, like, actors – you know, voiceover work is a, quite a bit different from, like, on-camera acting. But J.K. Simmons is awesome in this. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he has to deliver some really important monologues, and he just absolutely crushes it. Yeah, yeah, he he comes through on those, um, and yeah, he has to convey a lot of emotion kind of later in the the season, um, but I mean, he does that, he does it great. This was uh, Amazon Prime, correct? And I think uh, I know season two, like you said, has been greenlit. Do we have a release date that you know of? I don't think I've heard anything concrete. Yeah, not that I've heard of. Um, but just waiting around. Um, totally unrelated. And I know I don't think either of you watch this, but The Boys on Amazon Prime. Here's good three, things. Season three is coming out in June, so I'm excited for that one. Oh yeah, I did, I think uh, a trailer just dropped, I believe, for the next season. Oh damn, I don't know if I saw that, but I saw the update saying that oh it's coming out June sixth or third or something like that. I didn't watch it, but I saw it pop up on YouTube. On my, you might like. Nice. I'm gonna have to go watch that for this. Uh, Banner, what's your number two? Uh, my number two is, and I know you actually just recently uh, finished this, Only Murderers in the Building. God damn it. So my list is just like, that's my number two. God <laughs> damn. And I there think Nate and I have the same number one. So this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, this is one where I went in. All right, Steve Martin's going to be funny. I'm a fan of Selena Gomez. I can't stand Martin Short. So I went into this just I love first. him in this. Love uh, him in this. I hate that he's my favorite character. <laughs> Oliver, Oliver Putnam awesome. uh, and um, Armand from The White Lotus, two of my top three favorite TV characters this year. Dude, it, this <clears throat> was just a just a great show. I mean, it had twists and turns. It's relevant uh, just with how, how popular true crime podcasts are now. Yeah, it's just it's all isolated to to a single building, which, which I is, love, which is I so love cool. The setting yeah. of the Arconia. Yeah. yeah, and I love mystery shows where 
you're getting pieces of what happened through these flashbacks across the whole season that eventually do or show us the, the whole picture. Um, and they, they use that technique to perfection here. Yeah. I mean, to me, it was an absolutely perfect show from top to bottom. Perfect amounts of comedy. I would say it is primarily a comedy, but the murder mystery is very intriguing and they end every, pretty much every episode with like a, Oh shit type moment. Yeah. And Steve Martin uh, and Martin Short, I think Martin Short especially, is like punching at a weight that he has not swung at since his prime. No. All of Putnam is incredible in this. He's just absolutely fucking hilarious. Yeah, his, his little backhanded uh, comments to people, <laughs> and well, especially Steve Martin and, and the episodes are, are great. His addiction to dip. To dip. Was like, one of the funniest a- things I have ever heard in my life. I'm, they, a, I'm a big fan of hummuses too, so. When they go down to the lobby and he's just like grabbing the dips from the <laughs> buffet. Uh, and then Nathan Lane, obviously we're not going to spoil anything, but like his his character uh, was is really fun in this as well. Like I was not expecting to see him in this. And then when he showed up, I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Only Murders in the Building. I think you guys got me onto this, but the way you talked about it, it just seemed like it was a good show. I was not expecting it to crack my top three of the year. And this thing was re- like neck and neck with my number one, to be honest. Yeah. Recency bias, because I just watched it. Um, but it, would, it, would, it would, it probably cro- cracks my top five. It would probably, yeah, it'd probably come in at five if I had to rank that far out. Okay. I think we probably each watched like, what, 10, 11 series this year so that's upper half of yeah new half of them being came... marvel <laughs> right yeah <laughs> no marvels on our list unless there's a big surprise here yeah just as honorable mention loki would probably come in at four for me yeah yeah agree with that all right so my list has basically been told through the eyes of you two so <laughs> my number three is white lotus my number two is only murders in the building i'm just gonna go ahead and say my number one i think this is nate's all also yeah did you see this first and suggest I watch it? I think you did, right? I think so. I think that's how this one worked, yeah. Okay. And that is uh, the second HBO Max original, and that's Mayor of East Town, starring Kate Winslet. And so good. There is a motif here, and I don't think this is a spoiler for even White Lotus, because it's in the trailer and literally the first 30 seconds of the first episode, but a murder is involved in all three of my <laughs> shows, so maybe <laughs> I'm a little fucked up. Maybe I need to get some counseling yeah maybe, maybe i do do some help do some work on myself on jeremy and that's on jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> we could put him on the back burner for a little while yeah um yeah mayor of east town not a comedy at all but definitely has some moments of levity the character of mayor played by kate winslet first off the accent alone is fucking incredible mm-hmm. yeah, um she killed it i love me some guy pierce he's great in this her family is incredible uh and i just think it's a setting that you haven't typically seen. It, it sort of feels like True Detective on its surface, but as you dive into it, it's much less morose. It's still very self-serious, but it's more of a character piece, whereas as True Detective is just like, makes you feel like if you ever were to become a part of law enforcement or a criminal investigator, like your entire life would just fall apart. This has a little bit more hope in it, and, and that's kind of a spoiler, but let me just say... When you think that the mystery is solved, it might not be. Put it that way. Mm, yes. And like the God, like I thought that like things happen. I'm like, oh, this is wrapped up, resolved. And then shit just hits the fan at like the umpteenth hour. But it's not done sloppy. No, there's a there's a lot of groundwork done for it in previous episodes. They um, earned it. Yes. So they definitely earned it. Um. It, it, yeah. And the way it wraps up, like. Within the last like two episodes, like involving the murder, it probably flip flops like four or five times of what you think. But mm-hmm. like I said, it's not sloppy. Um, I think it's well done. Um, everything is relevant that they bring up. It's not like they just throw something at, in at the last second, um, like someone being Palpatine's granddaughter or something like that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm bitter. <laughs> Fuck you, JJ. But uh, no, super well done. Um, and yeah, I think it's a good mix of plot driven and character driven um and god i'm trying i'm looking at the cast and i can't find the fuck who was her quote unquote partner i'm not seeing his name on here 
Uh, oh my God, Quicksilver. Why is he not like up Evan Peters? Top? Evan Peters. Yeah. Oh, duh. That's yeah. Yeah. That's who it was. Um, I, I he did a great job. Um, in his role, got a lot of different feelings and emotions for him and from him. Um, I thought he was a great support um, to Kate Winslet in that. But yeah, overall, just really killed it top to bottom. Like first episode, last episode, um, it wrapped up super well, which I'm assuming it's an anthology. Um, and like to the last scene, like what happens in the last scene just like comes full circle. You have the closure, shut the book, you're done. It was awesome. Yeah. Very rewarding. And we uh, seasons one and three of True Detective were big fans of on the pod. But I will say this. The thing I, I appreciate about this show was True Detective had Nate and I like literally drunk at 2 a.m. <laughs> pausing scenes, combing over details in the background that this show does not require that level nah. of engagement to enjoy it. No, like pay attention. Don't have your phone out, you know, in certain scenes. But um, you will be rewarded for sitting through what is it, eight episodes, six episodes? Six or eight. Yeah, it wasn't too long. Yeah, you'll be rewarded in the end. You will not be left wanting. Put it that way. How is Peter's not in the top cast? I can't. He's not showing up on here. That's if you're on like IMDb, their like, billing is really weird sometimes. They changed their format like a couple months ago. and I don't know. Effed up. Anyway. A strongly worded email to them right after this. Uh, Banner, what's your number one show of the year? So because we were limited to was released in 2021, um, yeah. I watched this past year. I watched a lot of older shows, like got caught up on things or just plowed through an entire series. Uh, so my number one, I'm actually going to surprise you guys and go Hawkeye here. Wow. Can't Again, argue with it. It, it may be a little recency bias because that was the last new uh, show that I watched. Uh, that's not true. I watched Dexter New Blood. That's probably fourth on my list. Uh, oh, good. Cycli was not a huge fan, but he didn't hate it. Yeah, I didn't Solid. hate it. It was it was. We'll talk about it later. I'll talk about it in my protein shake. Um, Hawkeye was just so well executed, top to bottom. They just they just did a great job in every aspect that I'm looking for in a show. There was the love and compassion, the feelies action there was comedy and it all fit to get there was mystery i didn't know what was coming next i was surprised at times it all of those just blended and weaved together beautifully over over six episodes yeah totally agree i think as my sample size of shows in a year gets larger i start to appreciate more like the completism of an anthology series like it's great to have a show at times that like can can tell long form storytelling and leave you with a cliffhanger. But there's something to be said about just being able to sit down and watch six to eight episodes and just kind of be like, ah, and have like that relaxing exhale and be like that. That was a complete story. I'm good. To me, I would prefer a show over a movie, even if it's an, an anthology movie, just or show just one season that's six or eight episodes because of that aspect. I mean, essentially if you have just one season of a show, you have a really, really long movie. Mm -hmm. Well, before I, I have my worst show of the year, I don't know if you guys have that prepared off the top of your head, but before we go to that real quick, Nate, so having said that, the anthology format, which True Detective is really the only one off the top of my head I can think of that does this recently, but The White Lotus is getting a second season, but essentially a name only because it's going to be at a totally different resort. And from what I've heard, all new characters do you like that idea, and is that enough to get you, like if the creative team is back, to get you back in for a second season? Or do you look at it like, well, I like season one. This is You're going to have to resell me on this whole bill of goods. Uh, no, I'm all for the anthology. Um, to a certain extent, there's a little crossover, but Fargo does this as well. Um, there's a, there's a, Good point. There's some, there's some tie-ins and crossovers at some points with some of the seasons. Um, but love Fargo. Um, I think that shit, did that come out in 2021? I think that came out in 2020. Um, the, the fourth season, Chris Rock. Um, but yeah, all for that. Um, is yeah, Chris Rock for... and Jason Schwartzman in the same season? That's the mm -hmm. same one. Okay. Yep. Based in, uh, Kansas city, I believe if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, all, all, all for those. Um, 
now are we considering like Loki and Hawkeye and all those like anthology since there won't be other seasons, but they tie into the greater good. I think so. Is Loki okay. the only Disney Plus show that's been given a second season? Because I don't uh, think WandaVision has, and I don't think Falcon and Winter Soldier has. I believe, yeah, it and I then uh, right. What If are the only ones that oh, that's right. have more. Yeah. But I don't really count What If. It's yeah. But uh, when you, speaking of White Lotus a second ago, um, just saw recently Aubrey Plaza has been cast in season two, which I think she will fit perfectly. Oh my god, to go perfectly for. fits that <laughs> yes. universe. Jesus Christ. Yeah, dark, funny, weird. So I think, uh, and this is probably implicit, but it's just at another White Lotus resort. They're like the Marriott, basically. They have like different locations throughout the world. I haven't, I honestly haven't heard like that much about it. I just know it'll be at a different location and no, no crossover characters or very limited crossover. It's a great question. I, I'm sure I'm, I would hope just for kind of like a wink, n- wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the fans, like some random person will pop in even if it's just like a bartender or something <laughs> yeah i could actually have someone in mind that could cross over and it would kind of be funny but we'll see okay i don't know if you guys have anything prepared but worst show we saw of the year and if you don't have one prepared i know both of you watched a season of a show that you probably hated that i watched as well that i could oh do. i didn't finish it though so i think it should count okay i'll count it <laughs> i uh, probably Bain- finished it let's Bainer, do you have anything prepared no, I do not. I'm I'm sorry. Okay, Nate, why don't you just go with the layup here? No, okay, yeah, High School Musical, the musical, the series, which I think we're oh, still... Oh, fuck, yeah, I didn't finish that. Yeah, I'm the only okay. one who did, who had the balls to actually... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you know courage. it's bad if I don't finish it. Yeah, you had the courage to go through to the end. Um, we, we've talked about this, I think, ad nauseum on, on the pod, um, about how bad it was. It just teenaged angst to like the nth degree oh my god and they just bitch and moan the whole time i understand it's high school students but it just got in the way of the plot and the dialogue and everything and the first uh, season was actually pretty entertaining and this too. is that's why i came back to season two because i loved the first season yeah. so come on it's know not like i'm just are. hating on high school musical i'm just hating on the second season season one steered into the skid season two said well, Olivia Rodrigo is kind of a big deal. Let, let's actually try to turn this into a teen drama yeah. uh, under the guise of a, a parody of a musical. And like Nate said, I understand that teenagers are angsty. I, I work with them. But this was like literally every single character was just bitching the entire episode. And most of the time I couldn't understand what they were mad about or why they were mad. They were just It was mad, either miscommunication or something. Yeah. You're right. Oh, my God, Ricky. I was like, if I want to see this, I'll just go to work. Yeah, I see this all the time. So. Also, maybe I'm just remembering it differently because I didn't like season two. Way less music than season one, right? Yeah, I think so. Season for, one, every episode had a, a new song. Yeah. Yeah. With probably a 50% banger rate, which is pretty Not good. Not great. Not great. My worst show of the year, Nine Perfect Strangers on Hulu. Again, this is sort of like the amalgamation of all of our protein shakes. This is based on a book. And the cast was incredible. This is what got me in. Nicole Kidman, Melissa McCarthy, who I don't like, but she puts butts in seats. Michael Shannon, uh, Luke Evans, of course, from Mm. the Fast and Furious franchise. Bobby Cannavale, who's really good in this. And there's just nothing here, guys. There's no story to tell. You string me along for... 10 hour long episodes, which again, it's pretty grueling to get through this uh, on Hulu where they have commercials, which by the way, they crank the volume up to like 150%. Yeah, I fucking hate that. Yeah, it's really annoying. Uh, But at the end of the day, the juice definitely not worth the squeeze. I mean, they tease a lot of really cool ideas and every single there's probably three big reveals they set up throughout the show. Oh, for three at the end did not give a fuck about any of them. So yeah, that's that's tough. I'll and my, my, my wife had read the book and I'm starting to notice this. Look, I'm not one of those people who says if you adapt a book into a show or a movie like you can't change anything because a lot of times you have better ideas. But from what my wife told me, not imperfect strangers had basically changed so many core points of the book that there's no point in even calling it nine perfect strangers like 
if you're just trying to bring people in who read the book, like you're selling them a false bill of goods. Like this is not the same story at all. So whether the book, the book could be good or suck, but you didn't adapt the book. So don't call it the book, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, so you said that's on Hulu, right? It is. And I almost think it's worth watching the pilot just to be like, oh, okay, they set up a lot of interesting things and then read about the rest of it. Don't waste your time to see how they fucking drop the ball on this. Mm. Michael Shannon, though, great performance. I have to say. It, it, when does he not give a good performance? That's true. True, true. The guy usually always brings it. All right, anything else before we move on to Protein Shake? Do it. I'm good. All right, Protein Shake is the second part of our show where we go around and talk about what's in our cup. Also known as what have we watched lately? I have a light one this week. Four things, and one of them I kind of just talked about. I have a few other things to say about it. That's it. Nate, how about you? How many things are in your cup? I got three movies to talk about. I think we have one crossover. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which one. Uh, Brian, how about you? Uh, I got. Four movies and uh, two shows, but I'll go pretty quick through several of these. Okay, well, let's do I'm this. I'm pretty loaded. I, I have to go PP. Okay. So why don't you go first, and then Nate will go, and by then I'll, I'll sh- I should be back. Nate, if you could s- – do you have a movie that has Ben Affleck in it? <laughs> okay, there we go. Got okay, it. Okay, yeah, don't talk about that one until <laughs> I come back. Okay. <laughs> All right, Brian, what's in your cup? What do you want to start with? All right, uh, first one, we'll, uh, we'll go with Encanto crossover fuck yeah okay sweet well uh, okay go ahead what'd you think yeah yeah it's like too much lin-manuel miranda in my face the whole fucking time yeah it was it was it, okay it was entertaining it I was just, fine yeah yeah nothing really stood out to me and I, I i don't know i just my expectations for uh disney animated films now are so high um I've loved a lot I, of the, the recent ones, so. I I would agree with that. I just think that this one was a lot about the music, and the music didn't hit with me, except for that one where they're like, we don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. I love that song. <laughs> that one's pretty I, I good. Yeah. Other than that, though, there were, the songs weren't great. The story was fine. Yeah. Um, okay. I kind of wish that – I don't want to – it's it's fucking Encanto. I don't care if I spoil this for the fans. Yeah. I kind of wish that uh, the main chick got a power at the end of it. I thought that's said, where they were going to lead to. Yeah, and that's what I wanted. I didn't want her to just be a person. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that ended up just happening that way. I know, I think even before watching this, my wife had said something about, um, oh, there's not supposed to be like any antagonist in this. Um, and that was like one of the, like the points of like this movie is like, oh, there's no big antagonist. I don't, the grandma, abuela the, kind of put, played she's, an, she's kind of a bitch for a she's lot kind of, of it. a bitch. Yeah. Kind she a was bitch. a bitch to uh, everyone. Well, yeah, everyone, but especially Mar- uh, Maria. Mar- I can't remember the girl's name. Yeah, I don't know her name. Yeah, that's how the I mean, it was forgettable. Yeah. Uh, like I said, like it, it was enjoyable. Songs were it, OK, but it, it entertained me. Um, didn't live up to my standards. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, it was yep. it was fine. Totally, totally agree. Yep. Um, All right, Nate, you're up. Well, that knocked out one of mine, so um, <laughs> I'll uh, go with this one and leave our my crossover with horns for the last. Um, but this was actually from a suggestion. Might have been on the pod where I heard this a week or so ago from Cycli, um, but the lighthouse, Robert Pattinson. Willem Dafoe. You want me to keep going on in the cast list? You really can't because <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> now, with that being said, I thought it was great. Um, weird as shit. Um, not sure. entirely sure what I watched. Acting was phenomenal, um, as it would have to be um, for a quick plot synopsis. Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson are in a lighthouse on the rock. So there it is. Um, but no, they did a fucking fantastic job. Uh, it's going black back. and white also, right? Black and white shot in a Ooh. really interesting ratio, like four, three. So like 
on our now huge TVs. It looks so weird because it's like zoomed in. Well, it seems zoomed in, uh, but it's just like in a four three ratio in black and white. Um, but Old borderline. Style. Is it supposed to feel like claustrophobic? Is that why they did it that way? That could be it. I mean, it goes along with the theme of them just being in a lighthouse together. It's just those two guys. Um, it's marked some places a horror. I wouldn't really go that far. There's some like psychological s- horror, maybe. slightly scary moments with some of the scenes and some of the cut scenes and things like that. But yeah, it's more a dark psychological thriller. Are there any uh, jump scares? Not really. Um, and I don't like horror films, so, um, this, this didn't even like really scratch the surface going in that direction. Um, but I would definitely recommend it. Um, but yes, I mean, one of the weirder film films I've ever, ever seen, honestly, like some of the scenes that happen, some of the themes that are in there. Um, but dude, yeah, just seeing Pattinson and Defoe, like go back and forth at each other, um, with their monumental acting is phenomenal. It's it's really great. Are we looking at any type of twist at the end of this thing? Um, it kind of throws you in a direction that got me thinking of one thing that I thought was going to be a twist that wasn't. Um, but there's a few twists and turns throughout the movie, and I think this is one of those ones that it's so psychological, and um, they're basically losing losing their mind. I don't think it's much of a spoiler um, since they've been on there just those been on the island, just them two that you can probably take a few different things from it. And you can probably shape your own mind of what's happening to them. Um, but overall, I don't, I mean, fuck, I may have missed it because it was so all over the place, but I don't think there was like any huge, like monumental twists. It seemed like part of the kind of mystery of what's going on is the whole time, because they're in this isolated place by themselves you could tell like for a very prolonged period of time that it's like it's the unreliable narrator right it's like okay what are we seeing that is actually happening versus like you guys are just going fucking crazy that's definitely a key uh component of it um probably starting at the second act through the third um is there some hallucinations and their minds playing tricks on themselves so um that definitely plays a part into it but like i said definitely worth a watch um and the acting alone is enough to make me come away and say i enjoyed it yeah i'm on a willem defoe high right now yeah i won't spoil what i saw him in in case someone else listening to the pod hasn't seen the movie but (laughs) okay (laughs) all right i'll I'll knock one out here uh again season one of only murders in the building fucking loved it man it first off 30 minute run times i mean fuck me up fam like you could do 20 30 minute episodes and i feel like i could watch that faster than six hour long episodes 100 percent. get in and get out it's a weird thing yeah because we can just like watch watch it and it's low rent even though it is a murder mystery where like when you sit down to watch it, you don't have to be like, okay, what the what the fuck happened last time we saw this? Who who did what? Whose was where? Um, yeah, it's light. Yeah, and uh, Nate knows this very well. I'm a Selena Gomez head, big fan of anything she puts out. Um, so. Not to get off on a on a tangent, did you ever check out her Chef Show on HBO Max? Oh, I we watched she, one episode of it where she cooks. And I, yeah, and I liked it because she's like not a good cook. No. But she invites on, yeah, like renowned chefs and things. So it's 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 a good watch for sure. Yeah. And season two of this show, which again, season one ends on a very interesting note, while still being a complete season, uh, Cara Delevingne just got cast. So could be interesting. Yeah, but also Amy Schumer is going to be in it. She is? Are you kidding me? That's what I just saw, like, Shut as up. we were talking about it earlier. <sighs> I'm sorry. I know it was really bad news, but you could have waited until after the pod to tell me that. Oh, fuck. No, I'm going to tell you as soon as I know. My misery is your misery. You, you're damn married. It. You know how it goes. God damn it. You're right. Shirley McLean is also joining, though. Fuck. All right. Well, it was a one season show for me. Um, <laughs> it was a good run. <laughs> Fun what? while it lasted. One other thing I'll mention before I let Banner get a, a turn in. Um, I host a movie club at the school that I teach at, and the most recent movie we finished, it took us about three uh, club meetings to finish it, but Toy Story 2. 
fucking uh, love it. Toy Story 2. That's, very, that's my wife's favorite movie. Yeah, very underrated. Is it really her favorite movie? Her favorite movie? Not just her favorite Toy Story movie, her favorite movie. Wow. It's my favorite Toy Story movie for sure. I mean, you're wrong, but I respect it. Um, well, no, but okay. But I, it's it's good. It's really, really good. Um, the Al's Toy Barn part of it, I actually completely, like, I knew the Zerg stuff was there, and obviously Wayne Knight is, I mean, actually really good as Al. And that stuff's really funny. But I actually forgot, because to me, I just think of the Roundup Gang. Like, that's the story in my head, yeah. is is Woody and the Roundup Gang and his Woody's struggle. Woody's Roundup. <laughs> Which is actually, I would watch that show if they had like a 100% tournament. I would. Disney Plus needs to do that. Again, Disney again, 20, 30-minute episodes, give it to me. Mm-hmm. 107-minute episodes? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. Why that sound easier to watch? It doesn't make any <laughs> But I'm like, yeah, bro, I'd crush 100 of those. Yeah. That that's called YouTube, guys. <laughs> but the yeah. Woody's Roundup Gang stuff actually raises some really interesting questions about like duty and responsibility and like what is family and and all that stuff. Which as a kid kind of goes over your head, but as an adult watching it, I'm like, fuck, dude. There's some good subject matter here, and I love the the Zerg stuff. I it kind of loses me when like all the Buzz Light years get involved at Al's Toy Barn. Um. The, but the one thing that I think this is missing, and this is like not a problem with the other three Toy Stories, because I, especially Toy Story 3, I absolutely love, and it cracked my top 100 list at number 81. But the dynamic in the first one of like Woody being intimidated and afraid to lose uh, his meaning to Andy because of Buzz is something that you just can't. Like, that's the, the reason I'm so impressed John Laster was able to make such good sequels. Because that to me is like so powerful and awesome in the first Toy Story. And the fact that they made three other good to really good movies without having that, I think is really impressive. Because that's what's missing in the second one, even though it's still good, I think. True. Uh, true. I think it's supposed to be missing in the second one, though. Well, it has to be because it's resolved in the first one. Well, I mean, like, I don't know. I think they did what is so good about the toy story series is or the toy story movies in general is that the entire franchise is based on the villain. Woody is the villain in every single one of those movies. I, I agree. Yeah. But yet everybody loves Woody. Yeah. Cause really the first and second one, I guess I see what you're, I see your point, Maynard. The second one is still based on Woody's like need to find like purpose and a sense of belonging. Yes. And he's willing to basically drop Andy and his friends because he feels like he has that same or a more important role with the Roundup Gang, even if it means being shipped to Japan with people that he just met 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Also, and if you don't shed a tear when they're singing that song about uh, Jesse's oh, person, oh, my God, fuck. you're dead inside. Yeah, you are not a human. Corpse. You are not a human being. Well, that's a bit. There's a True. robot listening to this, like, but I loved it. <laughs> Emotion. Toy Story 2. All right, Banner, what else nice. you got? All right, I'm going to blow through a couple of these uh, so real quick. Uh, I watched Ready Player One again. You need help. It's, it's fine. I hate Ty Sheridan still. I really like the book. The movie was not great. I'll just leave it at that. I think the animation is cool, but is this on Disney Plus? No, this was actually on HBO Max. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, next, uh, Baby Banner wanted to watch Into the Spider Verse. Couldn't have wow. been more proud as a father. Raising her right. Um, and she loved it. We actually just started it again tonight for the second time through. Is uh, that nice? I, I don't know. I own it, so I don't, mm. I don't know. Um. I love Into the Spider Verse. It'll. I promise you, it's gonna make a very high appearance on my top 100 list. Um, I won't comment on mine, but it is on the list. Yeah, it's just a great. Again, I, I feel like I'm just beating a dead fucking horse today. It's just a great fucking movie. They did on everything paper, right. It, on paper, it shouldn't have worked, really. No, and the that year it went up against Incredibles 2, which is another fantastic fucking movie. And in my opinion, it beat it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
watched uh, Dexter New Blood. Uh, that was a obviously a 2021 show. All this was was them fixing what they fucked up 10 years ago. Not mad at it. I enjoyed it. Um, well, I kind of feel bad for the creators because, like, they obviously weren't up. The original creators came back for this, right? Correct. And they were not a part of the ending of the original. From what I understand. So even if they had an idea, it kind of sucks because they're like, well, first off, we have to clean up this mess, right? And it, it that's exactly what it was. The first three, maybe four episodes, you're like, I could tell this is Dexter, but it's not. And then the second half of the show or second half of the season, you really felt, OK, this is Dexter and you can feel this coming to a head. This should have been the last season. In my opinion, this should have been season five of Dexter. Um the Trinity Killer season wow. is, I still think is the best. I still think that's the best season, individual season of television I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And where this one goes, um, yeah, this should have been. This is how the series should have ended. Um, Without spoiling anything, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Do they explain? And and I won't even spoil the end of actual Dexter if people want to go back and binge the show. The but idea. do they do they explain how Dexter gets from the, the literal geographic location that he ends the original series in to where he starts this show in? Uh, it's almost like a throwaway line, like, I don't like basically, that. yeah, basically, hey, I went there and then I had to throw off the scent, so I came here again. Hmm. Is is more or less what it was. It was it's just a guy running from his name, changing his identity it that's that's all it was and again it's one of those things like do you buy it or you don't i bought it if i'm the creators i'm like look we have an idea we're doing our best we can based on what the fucking you know shit sandwich we were given to turn this into like a three-course meal so gotta work with us a little bit yeah i i would have liked to seen it done differently but i think this was satisfactory I'll take Fair satisfactory. Enough. Yeah, and that's it. That's it. So uh, here's my sorry, my my quick question: How many people now will subscribe to Showtime so they can binge the fuck out of this and then unsubscribe? From Showtime? Oh, you know how fucking pissed I am. I did like the one month free trial of Showtime and I forgot to fucking cancel it, and they charged me ten bucks today. That's their business model. So Brian, oh, don't sure. even try to call them to get your money back because I'm I, not. I hope they would literally tell you, like, sir, this is how we make our money is people yeah. get to cancel. No, I'm just I'm just going to go cancel it. Actually, I probably won't. I'm going to forget. But <laughs> I'm going to uh, let's be honest with ourselves. I'm going to I'm going to put on the facade that I'm going to go cancel it, but I won't. And they they get to keep my money. They might have some good movies on there. I mean, who knows? I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do, but hmm. I'm not going to check it out. Sorry, Showtime. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. All right, here's one that everybody can talk about. Book of Boba Fett. Uh, I'm not caught up. I'm not three episodes deep. I'm two. I'm only two episodes deep right now. Third okay. one at the time of recording dropped tonight. So I haven't. And oh, people, shit, yeah. And as people are listening to this, the fourth episode has probably come out. As well, probably, this yeah. Will drop next week. So, yeah, let's talk Eps 1 and 2 then. Okay. I. Full, sorry, full spoilers, right? For Book of Boba Fett, skip ahead maybe a minute. Yeah. Eh like three minutes there's really not that much to spoil though like no i mean we don't really know what's what's happening um for me so far i could care less about what they're doing in mos espa and him taking over jabba's rule i only care about boba fett and the sand people it's a that, it's a large that is, thread to be pulled on that is the most compelling thing to me i i've never liked boba fett i never understood it i never got it and this is the first time that i'm kind of interested in his character and that's only because he is hanging out with tuscan raiders i'll just say what i think is so great about the star wars universe is it can be so vast and big and have these big epic you know galactic space battles and it's about you know corruption of government and taking over the universe but you can also interest me with the fucking outskirts on a small desert planet. One bounty hunter is be, being befriended by like a group of 12 natives. And they're trying to stop this fucking train from driving through their. So fucking camp. cool. Like we can do both. 
I will say this. I don't know how I, I I'm with you. I'm not like a huge Boba Fett stan. I think he's one of those characters who is less cool the more you get to know about him. Like he's really fucking cool when he's like in the background of a scene. Yeah, the yeah, it's all about the mystery. That that was my whole thing with Han Solo too in the movie Solo, and I had to eat my words on that though. But and and I like what the show's doing so far. But I find myself like every time I watch the episode, I'm like, why does Boba Fett the whole time he's getting his ass beat? I thought he was supposed to be like this badass. He Everyone really... is beating the shit out of him. Kids, adults. I think a grown woman or an old woman at one point. Yeah, fucked him up. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there. Still may be recovering, recovering from the starlight pit. Probably. Maybe. I don't know. Last thing I got to say, uh, and Nate, especially I think this might appeal to you. I think Star Wars shows have realized, hey, if we exist as sort of like pseudo westerns, we can just fucking run this shit. Because that train sequence, I was getting like mad western homages. And everything on Tatooine and, of course, The Mandalorian. It just feels like Dave Filoni and... Uh, John Favreau are like, we just love Westerns and we love Star Wars. Like, why not just marry them together? Well, and Star Wars is a space Western. I mean, that's that's what it is, right? Yeah, I definitely think it plays More in a less. few different genres. But yeah, I mean, at its core, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that just by expanding on that, yeah, they've got lightning in a fucking bottle. And give yeah. me more. I, I want more. Yeah, I mean, Star Wars in general, I mean, it gets a little more political than most Westerns do. Um, but, yeah, I definitely see where you're, you're coming from. Um, but, yeah, the the train heist, I mean, it was it was awesome. It was just like in uh, Mando the last season, whenever they're breaking into the uh, Imperial base and they were yeah. fighting on, on oh, top yeah. of that transport that was going in. I forgot about that scene. Yeah, with, I can't remember what the, the cargo was that they are wanting on there. That, um, but that, like, it couldn't get too hot or something? Yeah, but the same yeah, yeah same thing. Got got a ton of fighting on top of a train vibes on that, and then the train heist in this um, with maybe the – I mean, maybe they're trying to play the Tuscan Raiders as the Native Americans of, of that – of tattooing so definitely really yeah. fits in there um but yeah so so far so good um hasn't blown my socks off but I've, i'm definitely intrigued and they've got me hooked in for the whole season same it's not one of those shows where it's like the second i get home from work on wednesday i like push my wife off the couch i'm like no fuck this we're watching boba fett yeah that's why i still haven't watched it i mean i forgot but i'm, I'm excited now that you guys reminded me that it's wednesday so that's cool <laughs> and again I, as people are listening to this this might have been revealed you know because we're two episodes behind but I was pretty jacked when that like Wookiee badass guy came out. He didn't do anything, but I was like, all right. Dark, I don't dark Chewbacca. Yeah. yeah. Apparently he's um, doing a little research the past couple of days. Um, him and Boba Fett have some experience together or know each other in some sort of way. Maybe this is just book related. I can't remember. Um, but I think – I don't know his name, so I'm just going to call him Dark Chewbacca. But apparently he's a fellow bounty hunter. Um, mm. So they, they give them – they each give each other kind of a look whenever they see each other. Like, I know you, motherfucker. They both dated the same girl just at different times in college. They're Eskimo yeah. brothers. Yeah. yeah. It's going to it's gonna come back later in another episode. It's who gave who herpes is what it, the real question is. Everyone got it at the end of the day, so that's all that matters. Right. So we're in this together. Good shit. Uh, Banner, anything else? I got one more thing that'll finish me out, so I'll just finish this uh jeff i know you watched this uh nate i'm not sure if you did don't look up i did mm -hmm. you did okay um i like real quick it's always interesting because i think we talked about this last protein shake where like we get to sit on it for like an extra week and then you come in fresh to see all of our different takes on the... yeah it's brian is this the scariest movie of the year unintentionally probably <laughs> like it is it is, yeah. on the, like on the surface you're like okay this is silly whatever and then you start to think about it and you have a issue that in some form is grounded by science right and then it's completely politicized and paraded around and then at the end of the day we have no idea what the fuck anybody is talking about this movie was a little as far as the visuals, a little artsy fartsy for me, a little, little out there, a little weird, 
but the acting was incredible. Leo was having a fucking blast. Jennifer Lawrence was having a fucking blast. Jonah Hill, I didn't like it first, but then I understood what he was trying to do and kind of the the uh, social class that he was playing or, or representing came through. This this is terrifying. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I, it was it was a modern day idiocracy. I know, but yeah. the scary thing is like we when idiocracy came out, it was like oh my god, can you imagine if? And now the question is like, is oh my do god, you remember you, when? You take the if off. It's like, can you imagine? It's like yeah, I can. <laughs> Hit a little too close to home on some of it. Uh, Brian, it took me looking at the cast list to realize this, but did you recognize Kate Blanchett in this? No. She is the like TV show host. I won't no spoil what happens shit. with her character. Yeah, so I don't know if they like. I'm assuming they put That's a lot of like facial. No fucking way. It. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I had no idea. What happens with their character or like what character she interacts with? But I had to look it up afterwards. I was like, who the fuck did she play? That's crazy. I yeah, I haven't I didn't really look at the cast list. I got several recommendations from from multiple people like, dude, you got to watch this movie. Mm -hmm. So we me and the wife sat down uh, last weekend and and knocked it out. And it was uh, that was entertaining for sure. I think Nate recommended it. He has a pretty good track record with me. So we watched it pretty quick. I, I got to say, I don't know if you guys even remember it, but Chris Evans had a hilarious cameo in this. <laughs> As the actor being interviewed about a movie about yeah. the world ending. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I I liked. Uh, I don't think this really spoils anything, but the uh, after credit scene with Jonah Hill. Oh yeah, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, that, that one. His character's focus would be in that moment. Right. That's like. That is probably. 80% of America in that situation. Let me just say, based on this and a scene in This is the End, Jonah Hill has an excellent comedic ability to do, like, really bad prayers to God. <laughs> yeah. True. Because his prayer in This is the End is hilarious, where he says, Dear God, it's Jonah Hill for Moneyball. <laughs> and then in, Moneyball. And then in this one, he's like, I know people are important, but there's also, like, cool shit, like, really there's nice like stuff. Yeah, and I want to pray for that too. Yeah, can't forget the stuff. <laughs> uh, that's all I got, guys. That's my right. uh, that's my protein shake. Nate, what do you have Full left? Full of protein. I only have one thing left because one of Brian's crossed over with mine, and it's a crossover with yours. Um, <laughs> so my thing is uh, I have to pee, and I don't want any spoilers. So you guys talk about this. Oh, cool. We well, watch it this it? weekend. Oh, okay. No, I, I'm gonna watch it this weekend. If you already, you already don't want to see this, so whatever. I, because of you guys guilted me into seeing it now. Yeah, and I hate to. I'm not gonna act like he's not the main character, but he kind of, he's like second build, I guess. You should still watch it. Yeah. Anyways, what I we're fucking what hate we're, Ty Sheridan though. I yes, I fucking hate him. Way. And he's not great in this, but don't. He, ah! <laughs> but that doesn't matter. Um. And fucking Clooney directed it. I, I'm sorry. I'm never going to get over Suburbicon. I'm never going to get over it. That's fair. That's what that's what we watch, Suburbicon. Spoiler. Actually, Nate, so, I think you are planning on watching Suburbicon soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try to now. Um, but anyways, watched uh, The Tinder Bar, which looks like Horns watched as well. <laughs> um, popped up on the Fire Stick, Amazon Prime. So... Saw a little Ben Affleck pop up there, watched the trailer, thought it looked good, tuned in. I really enjoyed it. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I got to say, Affleck, um, you know, over the years, I think I've just, and I know he, it's a lot of it self-inflicted, but I've really developed like a soft spot in my heart for him. Mm -hmm. When he's in the right roles, I just think he's really fucking good. And I kind of just feel bad for him. Like, I think he is pretty introspective and is like, look, I fucked up. Like, I shouldn't have cheated on Jennifer Garner. Like, I know that's my bad. Yeah. Um, and he just has a lot of talent. He's great in this role, man. I love yeah. in the very beginning, it's such a minor scene, but, and this isn't a spoiler because it's like literally the first 30 seconds, but they drive by and he's playing in either like an adult baseball league or an adult yeah. slow pitch league. Yeah. Just like the argument that he's having with one of his teammates is so ridiculous. 
in that scene. Yep. Yeah, pulls up and, well, that's my uncle out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's him. And, Nate, I've not been shy about this. I'm sort of a sucker, and I think you are too, for coming-of-age movies. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in a period piece here, setting it in, what, the early 70s? Early? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I and the accents so. are great. I will say this. It's based on a memoir. And, again, this isn't a spoiler either. But, like, as far as, like, events happening in the main characters' lives, there are a lot of things that, like, boxes you expect to be checked in a movie like this where a character grows up and you know has experiences ups and downs and a lot of the things that you would think would happen don't happen to him yeah yeah it uh yeah it's an interesting coming of age story in the way he gains his experiences <laughs> through his uncle's bar and his bar cronies and, and the the bar um normals in there and all that kind of stuff and the way that they develop relationships with him um throughout the throughout the movie is great okay so if we're gonna judge ty sheridan in this is he like like mud ty sheridan or is he like cyclops ty sheridan uh he's probably like for me halfway in between so like, almost like a ready player one ty ty sheridan I haven't seen Ready Player One. I mean, I like I, Ready Player One, so. Yeah, um, that that was a really bad example because a lot of people like it, and I fucking but hate it. But he's really, really good in mud, and I, he's not bad as Cyclops, but he's not good. I mean, he doesn't have much to do. He's he's given more meat to chew on here, and he does a decent job. But Affleck, he just acts circles around everybody else in this thing. Yeah, right? Affleck carries this one, and I'm fine with that. Um, so he doesn't. So Affleck doesn't necessarily compliment. Sheridan, like he doesn't make him look good, or is he making him look better? He elevates Sheridan, but I'd say about at least, and Nate, correct me if I'm wrong. I'd say at least half of Sheridan's scenes are without Affleck. Um, yeah, that's probably accurate. Mm -hmm. And Sheridan's, then, sorry, Nate. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and and Sheridan in this, he's in it. I mean, his character, you see him as a teenager into early adulthood, and you see him as a seven, eight, nine year old. So. Obviously, that that actor is not Ty Sheridan. Yeah, Daniel looks like Ranieri plays him as a kid, and I think he did a really good job. Yeah, love me a good kid actor, that's for sure. Yeah, that sounded really bad. Well, <laughs> that's fine. Let me ask you guys this: so, if a movie uses the phrase when it does the cast list and introduce, like if it said and introducing Nate Thurmond, are we to assume that that's his first credited acting role? Yeah, like otherwise, so. what? Okay, because it it says that with I, the Jacob Renieri kid, or Daniel Renieri kid. So I I don't know that I've ever seen that. Like I've heard it like s spoken, but I don't think I've ever like seen that in the credits. That's in the credits of this for the Daniel Renieri. Interesting. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would assume that that's his first like major bill. There was one trope throughout the whole thing that I don't know if I full. I mean, I understand the sentiment behind it. I just don't really know why they were doing it so much, but anytime he would introduce himself, Hey, I'm Jr. Oh, Jr. What does that stand for? Junior. They did that like 10 times whenever you like introduce him. Like, I know I don't, I don't, okay. His it's junior. It's not initial standing for something that they like really made an emphasis on that for some reason. I didn't really get the point. And as, as like an, uh, someone viewing the movie, you're like, okay, I get he might have to actually say that every time he meets someone. But as the audience, we've seen him the whole movie, and we've seen him introduce himself to like ten people. We don't need to see that over and over. Yeah, that, that didn't add much value, but it was it's really a point of emphasis. I felt like uh, they really drove home there. Um, and uh, su surprisingly, honorable mention for acting in this, um, Christopher Lloyd <laughs> comes in as his dude. Grandpa. He's awesome. <laughs> he was pretty funny. Damn, Christopher Lloyd's in it. He yeah. was funny in this. Yeah. And he's like a really crotchety old guy, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. He he wasn't – I mean he was in 15, 20 percent of the movie maybe. Um, but he he was a nice little addition. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll report back next week. You guys convinced me. Even though this has – already has two strikes when I'm starting out, I'll give it I'll give it a poke. Well, I know it's only as we're recording this January 12th, but I – threw and because I, uh, I didn't think Nate would have any uh, qualms with this. I already threw this up on as our first Brosker nomination of 2022 as Bro's Best Picture. Again, it could get bumped as we go throughout the year. but Nice. I like it. One other guy I want to give a shout-out to, Nate, and again, no spoilers here, but Max Martini, who I hadn't seen anything, but he plays JR's dad. 
I was a good scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> I love me a good scumbag. Yeah. Yeah, he's Play, uh plays a good scumbag. He pops in and out of this thing, uh, and I, I think knows he's like a great role player on a championship basketball team. Like Steve Kerr. Needs, yeah, hits corner threes, takes charges. Does what he needs to do. Yep. So uh, uh, Brian, I have one more I want to talk about. Oh, sorry. I, I just cleared my throat. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, you have to watch this movie and you have to make your wife sit next to you while you watch it. Oh boy. Because it is so fucking stupid and I was like crying on my couch last night. Uh, the 2010 comedy MacGruber. I ha- yeah, I haven't seen it. MacGruber? No, I haven't seen it. With, uh, you, you know who MacGruber is, right? It's Will Forte's Will character Forte. from SNL. I was about to say Will Sasso. I was like, that's not right. It's kind Will of making Forte. fun of MacGyver. 2010 comedy. It's on Peacock. You can borrow my login if you want. It is intentionally the it's it's like a modern day Ace Ventura, but it's like a little bit stupider. Oh my god, dude! I was fucking crying laughing at this thing. It is so stupid, but so hilarious. And Val Kilmer plays the villain, someone named <laughs> Dieter von Kunth is his name. What? Yeah, one, one more time. Dieter von Kunth, C U N T H. So that's Jesus. like us. That's like if uh, like like if Mike Tyson said that word. Yeah, basically. Uh, Ryan yeah. Phillippe is in it, and so is Kristen Wiig. And Banner, you'll like this. Powers Booth is in it from the World Security Council and Agents of Shield. Oh, nice. He plays the gen- <laughs> he plays the general uh, trying to recruit MacGruber. Uh, hang on, I want to look up the scene. This seems like a all right. I'm gonna start this at 11:30 at night, just stoned out of my mind. Watch it by myself. That's what this is turning into. Yes. Okay. Hang on. There's a quote that I need to find for you here. Okay. Because because it's there's a lot of really good quotes in this movie, but okay, here we go. Lieutenant Dixon Piper, who's Powers Booth, when he's no sorry, this is Ryan Phillippe's character. When they first meet MacGruber, this is what he says. The legendary MacGruber, former Navy, Navy SEAL, Army Ranger, and Green Beret. Served six tours in Desert Storm, four in Bosnia, three each in Angola, Somalia, Mozambique, Nicaragua, and Sierra Leone. Recipient of 16 Purple Hearts, three Congressional Medals, seven Presidential Medals of Bravery, and starting tight end for the University of Texas, El Paso. <laughs> <laughs> Gruber goes... That was a long time ago, Lieutenant. <laughs> and he's like 31. <laughs> oh, my God. That's right. the type of shit. How did you watch for. this? It's on Peacock. I'll give Peacock? you my log. I, I got, we, got, we got it. Okay. Yeah. But part of the reason I watch it, there's a new show that came out. And I don't know how they're going to do the show because the movie's like a hard R. Like anytime MacGruber needs anything, his first term of negotiation is he offers to suck the person's dick. <laughs> Like, literally, it could be the smallest favor. I will suck your dick. And they're like, no, you can just have it. You don't have to. Oh, my God. That's awesome. All right. But MacGruber. I'm MacGruber. Put it on the list. Uh, it's spelled like Mac Gruber, M-A-C. But it'll mm. pop up on peak. Like, hour 23 minutes. Oh, shit. That's a slow Tuesday. Yeah. I have the, the lowest Peacock tier, so there were, like, four ad breaks in it. Uh, I'm okay with that because I have to pee at least four times in an hour and 30 minutes. Perfect. But this is one of these movies the entire time I'm laughing harder and harder and my wife's not laughing at all, which makes me laugh harder. (laughs) I love those. I'm like, you don't think this is funny? She goes, this is so fucking stupid. (laughs) Also, MacGruber's main move is kind of a spoiler. Skip ahead, whatever, 30 seconds. You don't want MacGruber spoiled. But he rips people's throats out. (laughs) All right. He just grabs your cool. and like rips the fucking tent. If you if you don't want McGruber to be spoiled, you're on the wrong you're you're listening to the wrong podcast. No, you're just wrong in general. And Kristen Wig like gives such a reserved but hilarious performance in this. <laughs> I'm laughing just fucking thinking about this shit. Go check it out. All right, that's all I got. I know Brian's hitting his bong right now. <laughs> Nito. <laughs> Bruh! <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> that bird brings us to our last segment of the show. Do you even lift bra? Which is our question and answer segment where we ask you a question that we leave you with tonight's question, as has been the case since our, what, five year anniversary. Jesus Christ, we've been doing this a long time. That's <laughs> awesome. Is what are our top 100 movies of all time? And if you check the description, to this episode, you will find a link to a squad blog with an updated Google sheet to the minute of each of the five bros top 100 movies of all time lists. We will continue the countdown today. Before we do that, Nate, as is tradition, explain to the people what these lists are, because as I always say, this is not like your IMDb's best 100 movies ever made or like the AFI top 100. Should be, though. <laughs> yeah, maybe they need to take a page out of our dumbass books. Uh but no, this, these are our individual five top 100 lists. <clears throat> and even amongst the bros, it varies drastically, as we've already seen going through the first oh, roughly We've 20. surprisingly had a lot less crossover than I thought we were going to. I think the crossover will – well, God, I don't know. Certain of us will cross over once we get higher up, um, but it's still going to be so widely varied, and it's going to be great. Um but yeah, these are our lists. Um, and you could probably take, I don't know if I've said this before, but like a chunk of 10 and you could probably intermingle them. Like it's not exactly oh, 79. Oh, this is exactly 79. It could probably be like 74. It could be like 86. I don't know. It's yeah. somewhere just in this range. It's close because it's tough to like actually say, oh shit, this is where this ranks in this. But these are our own top 100s. Um, so, yeah, like we said before, not going to be the IMDb top 100, top 250, whatever. Um, these are our list. They may mean something individually to each one of us for a different reason. Um, and it was really eye-opening and kind of great putting these together because it made you th really think and get in-depth in the movies and really understand, like, why you love these movies. And brings up a lot of great memories from your life. And I think cycling – I mentioned this on like the last episode. Go through and try to do this exercise on your own if you're at home because it is fun. It is fun to try and like place these because they don't rank where you think they are. And I actually think, Nate, you can probably echo this. The last episode with you, Cycli, and myself, we started to get into the territory of, wow, I thought that movie would be way higher on your list with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, th I think one of the, yeah, my 81, the last one, super bad. Um, yeah, it could have ranked higher, but I mean, it, it's still great. I mean, anything in the top 100, and I think we there's a testament to this. Um, Horn said a, a while back is a, a movie, maybe been like Ant Man or Ant Man versus Wasp, a movie he really likes is like 300 on his list. Yeah, I have 1100 on my list. So yeah. if you made the top 100, good for you. And I'm jacked up to see the rest of Nate's list because if there's 80 movies that he liked more than super bad, like that's really fucking interesting to me. <laughs> well, here we go. We're ready to kick it off. But right, then so you have the, other, you got the other way too. like horns. You were having buyer's remorse because Phantom Menace did not crack your top 100. Yeah. And I tell Nate every day, my biggest regret in life is that Palm Springs from this past year didn't quite make my, it was my one Oh one. Didn't quite make my top 100. So we're banners just a few behind uh, Nate and I because we were on the last episode and he wasn't. So banner, you're up to your number 82 movie of all time. We'll have you do four today. That way you'll get even pace with us. Your number 83 last time we spoke to you was the 2017 version of murder on the Orient Express, a movie I really like. Didn't make my top 100 list, but I really like it. All right. So what's so your number 82? 82. This is a movie that, if I think about, I mean, obviously I'd, I've never physically put this list together until we did this, but as I think about it, the last seven, five, seven years, this movie has gained a lot of traction in my mind. Uh, if we would have done this five years ago, this movie would not be in the top 100, and that's Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. This movie has gotten way better with age, in my opinion, to me. Um, I think just the more I understand how we, how stories are told and, and the more mature I get, the better this movie gets. Oh God, you said mature, not mature. Oh, whatever. Sign. No, no. I mean, that's a sign of maturity. I'm pretty mature. 
So I let me say this. I think as time has gone on, and Banner, you have I think encapsulated this perfectly. It is a generational thing for us. Yeah. I have become a bigger and bigger defender of the prequels. Like if someone at a bar were to talk shit about one of the prequel movies, we would have some words. Even though at the time I saw them, I was underwhelmed. I think that I like Phantom Menace the most of these. So I'm kind of surprised you have Phantom Menace at 95 and this at 82, to be honest. Well, and I will be 100% honest, and I'm not saying that this is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, This movie is complemented by the Clone Wars Mm. so much. And, And Thurman, you can attest to this. Clone Wars needs to be told... He says, no, I can't. He shakes his head. <laughs> All right, whatever. Well, I think uh, the I'm, ki- I'm kidding. Go ahead. I was just fucking with you. I know. I know you were. I'm Clone just... Wars sets this movie up. Attack of the Clones does not. And that's a shame. Um, yeah. Because if you actually watch... Wow. Like if that. you actually watch the show, everything that we complain about the movie, you understand. I mean, and it makes okay. sense. You see... Yeah. you. You see his turn to the dark side in the show, which makes the the inevitable turn that more powerful and why where he is at emotionally at that time. Um, the fact that you don't even know he has a pad one that he lost. It's easy to say this, obviously, because Clone Wars had seven seasons, so you can get more in depth and everything. But there's obviously a better way uh, they could have incorporated this into the movie. Um, and shown a little bit more of why he was so um, indignant against the Jedi, against the mm-hmm. Masters and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the little tidbits they threw in there to like put a, a spur in his boot um, to make him angry and had him turn, it got the job done. But yeah, Clone Wars, the series, like, does such a better job of like building that arc. And comp- like this is this is the bow on top to that series, which is weird to say because this came out however many years after the movie did, and and it's all retcon. Yeah. And but Filoni did a fabulous job with that show, making this a much much better movie, in my opinion. So I'm running through Clone Wars, you know, as we speak. Yet yeah, literally yesterday I watched season two, episode sixteen, Cat and Mouse. And to that point, this is the one where Anakin is given the uh, large space freighter that has cloaking abilities on it. And the whole yeah. time says, fuck you, Obi-Wan. I'm just going to ignore everything you tell me to do. You can kind of start to see his tension with the Jedi because he continually is insubordinate yet gets the job done. So he's kind of like, why the fuck would I listen to you when you're always wrong? Yep. Yeah, it, he he starts to turn into a joke with the Jedi. Like, oh, that's just Skywalker. Yeah, Obi-Wan honestly, like... as. He shit talks him a lot in Clone Wars and he does it all like, haha, I'm kidding. He's like, yeah, but are you? Yeah. So that was 82 uh, Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. What is your number 81 movie of all time? 81 Training Day. Great movie. I mm. love this it. movie. Um, the only other I, one I could see having this on their list might be Geiger. I, I, I can see Geiger having this on his list. Um. Yeah, this is just I love the dynamic of Denzel and Ethan Hawke, um, their chemistry and that relationship that they build over the course of of the movie. It's just I really enjoyed that. There's no other no other explanation for it. Am I crazy if I say this might be the best Denzel performance I've ever seen? No, he's out of his mind in this. no. I wouldn't say you're crazy. Um, I think there's a movie. Yep, yeah, definitely. A movie I have up higher on my list. That's a Denzel that I rank higher. But um, definitely vintage Denzel. Yeah, and, uh, I, you know, I love movies set in a day. Yep. So yeah. already has me, has me sold there. Yep. Great fucking pick. All right, Nate, let's go to you for your number 80. Last no, we had you clocked I'm in. Good. No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next. Just go fuck myself. All right, go ahead. Last video clocked in at number 81 with one of my favorites, Superbad. What the hell could you possibly like more than the movie Superbad at number 80? I mean, there's <laughs> there's 80 more films. Um, 
And like I said, this could be like 70. I don't know. My my list is kind of now. It's hard. This is really hard. It is hard. Like, and then I look at it, I'm like, shit, do I like this more than some of these? And like, obviously, as you get up there, yes. Um, Well, sorry, real quick. I'm already telling you guys in like a year, we'll take a break. But then we're going to do our bottom 100 movies. Ooh, it's going to be even harder. That is going to be way harder. Wow. (laughs) Okay. All right. Anyways. Coming in for me at number 80, um, throwing it back a little bit. We're going back to 1954. Um, and we're logging in the Alfred Hitchcock classic, Rear Window. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Yes. There we go. God. Sex Rear up. Window. So, um, I mean, maybe a product of COVID, but I feel like we were doing this a little bit before. Um, me and the wife try to start watching some older films. Um, honestly, she tried to start Max. They have a really good older library. I know the, uh, uh, Turner classic movies. Yeah. That okay, little, sweet. That, that little section. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, I think she tried to start me by watching breakfast at Tiffany's with Aud- Aud- Audrey Hepburn. I actually fell asleep during it. I haven't finished it. Not a huge fan of that one, but that kind of got us on the trip of watching some older movies. Rear window, probably watched that a uh, year or so ago or within a year. Fantastic. Love rear window. Love Fantastic rear movie. Window. And I mean, it, it's just, I, I, it is going to come up again <clears throat> later on in this, uh, whatever we're calling this segment. The top 100. Yeah. <laughs> what are we calling? <laughs> Nate, sorry, before you continue, I, I'm a little embarrassed, but I do like this movie. I have it below Disturbia, which is respectfully a remake of it by a lot, like 200 spots. But on my list, and again, these are fluid. I have it at 457 out of 1100, below Small Soldiers, but ahead of Foxcatcher. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna knock anyone's list. <clears throat> um, but I mean, this is a such an acclaimed movie. Um, you see this. I don't even want to call it a trope because it's just a great piece of cinematography of the way they shot this. 100%. You see it all the time you see bits of it i mean you'll see even like small clips of it you see it used quite a bit in only murders in the building because of the building they're in even the opening credits oh it's a pan down from a building where does that come from it comes from rear, rear window uh mr james stewart or jimmy as some people heard, like of, to call him. Him. heard of him um grace what, kelly i mean what this movie did for just historical cinema and modern cinema is incredible like how things are filmed is because of of movies like rear window yeah and i think i got i used to get hung up on older movies and just being different dialogue a lot of people have that mid-atlantic accent that a lot of people had back then that isn't really british but it's not how americans speak um but if you can get past that um yeah, there's just a, a lot of depth to these. And it's just a it's a great murder mystery at the end of the day. And like I said, the way it was shot, critically acclaimed, you see bits and pieces of it in so many movies and TV shows today. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. It has it hits kind of all the points. It's got a few lighter moments whenever he has his girlfriend visiting him in, in his um, apartment. He's kind of bummed up with his broken leg and everything so it 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 sets up nicely it's it gives you that i mean no one wants to be a voyeur but everyone kind of has that in the back of their head like spying on people oh that's kind of curious yeah yeah we're all curious and you you get that i'm a people watcher yeah oh yeah go go sit down and just people watch but you get that kind of primitive fix in the back of your head with this um as for watching people and saying oh man i'm looking into their lives and all that kind of stuff so it it's got a lot to it, um, and yeah, it's just a fantastically shot shot film. This is a great fucking pick, man. And I gotta say, I, kind of tying back into you talking about the lighthouse, it sort of brings up the unreliable narrator trope again because you start to ask yourself, well, is this guy really seeing this stuff, or is he just so stir crazy that mm-hmm. he's like trying to find stuff around his apartment complex to keep his interest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You start you start wondering that kind of through the film and then ultimately realize the real murder mystery of the whole film. But number 80 rear window. And without any spoilers, how cool is the scene involving, uh, the flash on his camera? 
towards the end of the movie. Again, oh, yeah. fucking classic. <laughs> so intense. It's right? it's great. It's a little over the top, but it it's still great. I love it. <laughs> the original I, Saw actually pretty much ripped that scene off. Uh, that '70s show does like a Alfred Hitchcock uh, Halloween episode, and they use that. Also. Oh, really? That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's awesome. Nice. All right, we're going to do it at number eighty for Nate. My number eighty, and this is one that I, I mean, I'm sure I. If this is not on Nate's list somewhere higher up, I'll chop off Banner's dick. Oh boy. Uh, Whoa, this escalated quickly. And that is, uh, and again, this is one that I just have a great memory of when we saw it in theaters. But it is the, I'm trying to look up the year here, 2008 classic, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Okay. Oh, Banner, man. your dick is safe. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> You're lucky. Yes. Uh, I remember that, that might have been one of the, this is going to be weird to say, but one of the only movies that the three of us have gone to the theaters and saw together. That's see, okay, crazy. Now, been see, I can, so I, can long, play, I can play on the other side of the fence on this one. Horns, how is that so high on your list? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm kind of surprised, too. Yeah. I really am, because this is so fucking quotable. Um, between just the dinner scene alone, where he's like, it's a metaphor for addiction to technology. It's meant for a shit movie. That's what it is. You would have voiced reason. <laughs> And uh, I don't know, just every fucking quote Jason Siegel has in and of his prime. Bill Hader, Kristen Bell before we really knew what she was, Mila Kunis, Russell Brand giving the performance of his life as Aldous Snow. It's just yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah, he, he plays an amazing role. You get some <laughs> good dry comedy from him, and then you get You're some... You're fucking some, Billy Baldwin! <laughs> some some banger songs out of him, too, so... That's true. And then yeah. who can forget Jonah Hill's character at the hotel? <laughs> hotel is obsessed with that and nate how many times do we quote just went from six to midnight just went oh it's tons of time that's like i mean that's a classic yeah that's a classic boner boner trope now when al snow goes up there to sing and he's like we're just two dudes on a beach and he fucking 69 helen mirren (laughs) are you from london when he calls him up on stage and he goes share your gift (laughs) What an eccentric uh, and confident young man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, my shirt. Oh, Is no. Is that stupid British accent supposed to be me? Sadly, yes. Take my eyes, but not the shirt. Not I the admire shirt. Sir Tommy Bahama. He's I a do. brilliant man. <laughs> Jesus uh, Christ. It's, it's he brings him the cake. It's definitely from the hotel. Definitely not from me, personally. If anyone <laughs> asks. <laughs> he, like, sprints away. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> It's so weird. Did you get my mixtape? Did you get it? People at home are like, yeah, I've seen the movie. Stop fucking quoting yeah. it. I'm sorry. This is our lives. This is why yeah, it's up here. That's exactly what I was about to say. I'm sorry. This is what we do. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's just, again, half the conversation, every conversation Nate and I have over like 10 minutes long, one of a quote from this movie will somehow squeeze its way in. Oh, and sure. never, never mind. Maybe the most used quote of all time from Paul Rudd. Well, you have to do more now than that. You're just boogie boarding. Yeah. I'm um, actually nope. one of the, one of the lines I may use on a daily basis and probably with people who don't even get is kind of now, kind of, now. <laughs> kind of. do you want, you do you want to gag, do you want to gag, gag me? <laughs> kind of now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm being so weird now. It's okay. You've pretty much been weird the whole time. <laughs> like my wife asked me if I want dinner kind of now Just for no reason, just because it pops into my head. I don't know. <laughs> and how great is the quote with Paul Rudd's character about not having a watch anymore? Yeah, oh, yeah so I got it's kind of like watch. the same thing. All right, so it's basically the same. Yeah, once I moved out here, I got rid of my watch. It's like, fuck, that's cool. Yeah, yeah my phone has a clock on it, so. <laughs> You're kind of like a dog, Neil Diamond. Fuck, that's like exactly what I was going for. It sucks because I hate you in so many ways, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I get why Sarah likes you. <laughs> yeah, oh, that is what he says. Yeah, <laughs> I get why Sarah likes you. Uh, the rewatch. So good. Soon. All right, we could say you're quoting that movie. We forever. basically Bandit. just watched the movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm Thank sorry. you for watching our review of Forgetting Star Marshall. And if you're at home, like Nate said, that's just why it's on the list because we could just <laughs> literally say the fucking title of the movie and then quote the house. <laughs> well, I uh, fucked the housekeeper. So, <laughs> All right, Brian, what's your uh, number eighty? What's just had a training day? Uh, ten Cloverfield Lane. Love it. Mm. Uh. This is I'm not a big fan of thriller, scary, jumpy movies, Um, 
I didn't realize that's what this kind of was going into it because we see Cloverfield, right? That's like a first person uh, shot from a camcorder yeah. running through New York. So yeah, I just I thought, thought that's kind of how Cloverfield was. I haven't seen that either, but no, that's sorry, how that that's what he's talking. That about. is close Cloverfield. Yes. Yeah. This is a traditional. Movie. This is like a regularly filmed movie. Are they not related? They are in universe, I believe. We don't yes. know yet. We don't no. know. And <laughs> okay. that's something I want to talk about is <laughs> <laughs> Cloverfield was fine. It made me dizzy to watch it because of the, the shaky camera. Um, and then we have Cloverfield Paradox, which is in the same universe also, maybe. And then 10 so Cloverfield Clo- Field Lane. Yeah, so Cloverfield Paradox clocks in at 1,016 on my list out of 1,054. So that shows you what I think about that movie. Right. The uh, other two I might I will mention at a later date. Let me just put it that way. Both of them? Really? Wow. To me, 10 Cloverfield Lane was the only competent movie of the three. Really? I did not. I I wasn't a big fan. And maybe it's just because of how it was shot, but I did not really like Cloverfield. Now, 10 Cloverfield Lane, uh, John Goodman's performance in that is, I think that's his best performance, right? It's creepy as fuck, man. It's, but he, he's so fucking good. And it's close quarters. We don't know what's happening yep. the whole time. And then when we yep. do know what's happening, we're almost more scared. Yeah. We yeah. are more scared, I would say. And I think that's another reason that I love that is that it's this suspenseful, uh, thriller, right? Until the last what 10 15 minutes, and it's almost just a s- straight sci fi action. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the strength and weakness of the Cloverfield franchise is it doesn't know what it is, but when it locks in on something, it nails it. Yeah, great pick. I'm actually shocked you like that so much. I'm happy. I, uh, yeah, that's that was one that I. As I'm making this list, I'm like, damn, this thing is climbing and it's mm-hmm. climbing fast. Yeah. Awesome. That was it. All right. Uh, Nate, last one of the night. What's your number 79 movie of all time? Just ahead of rear window. <clears throat> um, so a lot of people said we couldn't do it, but um, we're actually going before rear window in chronological order and going before 1954. Wow. Good for you. J- jumping back. Um, and didn't plan this, just shook out this way. Uh, not sure if either one of you have seen this one, but The Great Dictator is what clocks in. What year is this? At number 70, 1940. God, I, you legitimize this podcast so much. By God, Charles Chaplin. Our IQ just raised like 400 points. For real. <laughs> Heard of him? Um, Damn. Is wow. Another... Uh, TMC or TCM? Uh, I can't remember where I watched this. I'm sure it might be on there. Uh, oh, yeah, probably. It says watch on HBO Max. Yeah, I'm sure it's under their Turner Classic Movies uh, moniker. Um, Com- the, the genres, according to Google, are comedy slash war. <laughs> war, is, war is just a category, a genre now. <laughs> and those two go together. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, at, at face value, I mean, you see Charlie Chaplin on there. <clears throat> It's going to be kind of a slapsticky comedy thing, um, but it, more behind this movie kind of legitimizes it and makes it a great film in and of, of itself. Um, he's it, it's basically a parody about Hitler, made in 1940. Now wow. that takes some balls. That takes, some, balls. takes some balls, and even more to that, I'll, a little background on this uh, because when I watched this, I'd kind of researched it a little bit. Um, but no producing company over in America would do it um, just because of the time. So it was like 1939, probably um, 1938, maybe whenever he was trying to get this going. And all the producing companies or big film companies over here still had some ties to like German industry and they didn't want to fuck with them and, and like burn any bridges. So Charlie Chaplin was like, fuck it, I'll just produce it myself. So he put up all the money for it. He produced it himself. He did all that um, just because he felt it was important enough to get this out there. Um now, are there some touchy subjects put in this? 
obviously he's making fun of fucking Hitler in this. He <laughs> plays Hitler. black face in this. There has to be, right? Uh, I don't think there's any blackface, mainly because it's just based over in Europe and has to do with Hitler and Nazis and Jewish people, right. which he plays Hitler. And then he also plays um, a dual role as a uh, Jewish guy in this as yeah, well. Yeah, he's Adenoid Hinkle, also Chaplin, and yeah, plays a Jewish barber. I don't think I see the name here. Yeah, um, but he plays – dictator uh hinkle dictator of, of uh tomania or something a made-up country just so there weren't actually any direct ties um but man he does a great job i mean it's it's so it seems low brow just him literally probably making up german dialogue throughout the whole thing whenever he's yelling <laughs> at him, just assuming he's just making it up and like at face value you're like oh that's pretty low brow there's like no thought into it but um it was just a great period piece, a great testament to him just saying, fuck you, I'm going to make this movie. And then, like I said, it was just really great. And at the very end, him as Hinkle or Hitler, the dictator there, he has a really powerful speech to like a huge crowd, which was a big part of Hitler in history as he was a great orator. Yes. And But it's in English. Um, but he kind of just speaks to – see like, Chaplin speaking is cool in and of itself. Being a human and kind of getting into the a lot of those principles and just saying, hey, we're all one um, and kind of summarizing what people should have been thinking at that time instead of mass genocide. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> overall, uh, a great fucking movie. Um, everyone I'm, should go see it. That's great you have this. 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, 8.4 on IMDb, which IMDb, as we've learned in our – uh, in our box office contest shows, I can't remember the fucking name of it right now because I'm focused on something else. Eight point four, and it grossed three point four million dollars. Holy shit! In nineteen forty, which I've just calculated out is equivalent to sixty four point six million now. And this is at a time where the country was at war, effectively. So going out to the yeah. movies, like basically equate it to a pandemic, essentially. Yeah, and the, there's like a five minute scene where he takes this globe out of its like holster, and it ends up it's like a balloon. He just like is playing with it and like kicking it in the air and doing like all these pirouettes and things. Do you think that's where? It's you think ridiculous. That's where, uh, Mike Myers got the mo- motivation and go- uh, the spy who shagged me, where Doctor Evil's like dribbling and shooting the globe. Yeah, that he- <laughs> that's actually a very good point. <laughs> Might be some. Uh, some uh, parallels there. I'll but. have to check this out. I uh, I went back and watched, and by went back, I mean watched for the first time, but went back as in it's a very old movie, Citizen Kane on HBO Max a few months back because I was like, I need to see what the fuss is about. And I actually really, these movies are like really fun, I think. I need, yeah, that's one of those ones I need to go back and watch, watch too. So I'm glad you have one of those on the list. That's got to be the oldest movie anyone has on here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not Probably. even close. I mean, 82 years, there's no way we can. Hold on. It, that's, that's, that probably beats anything by 20 years. Um, I guess I other I'm... other than your other one that was like 15. <laughs> <laughs> if you exclude the one right before it. Yeah, nineteen. Yeah, 1954. I thought I had another one on here that was pretty early. I'm not seeing it, though. I don't think it made the, the top 100. All right, Banner, ahead of 10 Cloverfield Lane, which was your number 80, what is your number 79? Uh, again, one that I I wasn't expecting to be this high, Sleepy Hollow. Uh, I had a lot uh, of this when we went back to rewatch it. Yeah, I think that was something that really helped this climb climb high in the ladder. Uh, did a commentary on it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Check it out around Halloween is a great time to do it, especially, you know? Yeah, it's uh, just as... Again, it's just a great, great telling of a of an old story. The, the ancillary cast, like, first off, Emperor Palpatine being in uh, it helps a lot. Michael yeah. Gao, who's the Alfred from the Michael Keaton Batman movies, is in it. That helps a lot. Count Dooku. He's in it also, Christopher Lee. Oh, yeah, he's the yeah. judge at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is... One of those weird times where 
Tim Burton actually hits. Right? Yeah. And we've talked about this a lot. If you're at home, like, bullshit, bro. Burton rocks. Like, okay, but actually go look at his filmography. Does he rock? Yeah. We've yeah. done. I think we've dedicated an entire episode to this, in fact. Yeah, we have. He, he had the two really good Batman movies. Nightmare Edward's, Before Christmas. Right, which, did he even direct that? I know he wrote it. Uh, I believe he directed it. Okay, but and then he had uh, basically this. Yeah. And Edward Scissorhands, which some people actually don't even like, so. Yeah, yeah. it's meh for me. All right, Sleepy Hollow is your number 79 movie of all time. My yeah. number 79 to round us out for night. Sorry, Bandit, do you have anything else you want to? No. No. My number 79 is the 2006 Christopher Nolan film, The Prestige. Ooh. ooh, ooh. Starring, I mean, the cast here is fucking incredible, but we got Christian Bale, Hugh Jackman, <clears throat> ScarJo, of course, Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Fucking Christopher Nolan movie. Rebecca Hall, David Bowie is in it. He actually plays Nikolai Tesla. We got our boy Andy Serkis. Uh, this thing is great. And I think at a time when Batman Begins came out the year before, basically put Hollywood on notice. Like, hey, Christopher Nolan's about to fuck you up, fam. So watch out. Because the, the Dark Knight was two years later, and he at that point he pretty much owned Hollywood. Maybe one of my favorite twists. Yes. A great, great fucking twist. So good. This will <clears throat> This will make an appearance for me. Yeah, so I won't talk too much about it then. All that I'll say is that this let me know that – so I'd seen Memento. I didn't see Insomnia before this, which is the, I think Nolan's like first film or maybe came out right after Memento. But when I saw this, I said to myself, I this is my director. Like anything he puts out, even if the trailer doesn't look good, I will give it a chance because this guy knows what the fuck he's doing. And like Nate said, just – a great twist and something that I like when you look at it on its surface, you're not like it's not like insanely mind blowing. It's really clever, but I, it was just something I hadn't seen before. Yeah, I think it's it's really well done. And it, I used a word I used earlier. It's not sloppy because they lay the groundwork. You don't notice it. And then they go back and show you, hey, we showed you all this shit like. This is kind of how it stacks up and it all fits together and it fits together nicely as a puzzle piece. So, yeah. And I obviously I won't spoil it because that's the fun. But as you're watching the movie, you're kind of guessing like, OK, are we going to go genre here? Or is there like what's that? Like even like the type of twist it is, you're trying to guess along the way and you probably won't get it right. At least I didn't. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. All right, The Prestige is my number 79. That's a good place to end for tonight. Before we let the people go, any closing thoughts? Nate, I'll let you go first. Um, closing thoughts. Let's see. Um, we kind of talked about uh, upcoming movies on recent pod. Great Marvel year coming up. I'm excited after coming off a nice and Marvel year with TV series. So going to double down with Marvel movies this year. So buckle up. Yeah, I'm like already have a boner for Doctor Strange too, just because the possibilities there are. We thought the multiverse possibilities for Spider Man were crazy. What do you see? What the fuck happens here? Let's go. I've heard some insane rumors. Boehner, how about you? My closing thoughts is going to upset you. So what, why don't you go first? All right, I've got I've I've got two. One, I'm just looking at this top 100 list that I've made and. The difference between my number 13, 12, and 11 movies is so incredibly different. And, like, the type of movies they are? And the type of movies they are, and, like, I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm blowing my own fucking mind by my own fucking list right now. It's the uh, beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely uh, challenge anybody at home to try and do this. It's a lot of fun. It's and as new movies, yeah. it's really hard, too, because as new movies come out, like, I want to put them up here. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I agree. Very, the bar and Don't Look Up, I thought would be flirting with my top 100. After I crunched the numbers, they weren't, like, way off, but they weren't, like, 
in danger of knocking anybody out. Let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah, that was that's a that's a solid middle tier movie. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm excited to get down to the nitty gritty here with this list. It's getting because when we get to like top fifty territory, that's where I think we can start. Like, this is like serious shit, you know. Like we all have thirty plus years of movie watching experience. That's assuming we started when we were like two or three, because fuck, we're old. So for someone yeah. to be up there that high, it's got to be pretty special to you. Uh, and everybody, please, again, let's pull over for emergency vehicles. It's not Rainer, that hard. I'm glad you said that because I was driving home from work last Friday, and dude, it was disgusting. There was a fire truck in the left lane trying to get where it needed to go and people were not getting over and i was like dude fuck like i get we're getting home from work someone's life could be on the line and people suck man just yeah you know, okay you know what i know people don't care about other people so somebody's dog could be on fire in that house Ooh. wow good point people <laughs> care about puppies yeah that's how you get the word out and i'll just Add on to that with a separate piece of advice, and this is my new one. Please make smart decisions when getting your hair cut, okay? The person in front of me, last time I went to the barber shop a few weeks ago, went with a blue hair dye. And let me just say mm. that they were of age where they have a legitimate job, I would hope. Like, this wasn't like a 15-year-old, like, fuck it, bro, who cares? It happens. Yeah. What, what if you don't like let it child, happen to you? Don't let it happen to you. Learn from this person's mistake. Yeah. All right. For the American hero, Nate Thurman and the mad scientist, Brian Banner, I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and we are the Bro Four Squad podcast. Thank you guys so much for checking us out. Follow us on Twitter at Bro Four Squad. You can find us on Letterboxd, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, iHeartRadio, anywhere you find your podcasts. If you type in Bro Force squad as three separate words and check out everything that we do and our squad blog with our top 100 movies of all time list on our website bro4squad.com till next time we'll see you hopefully in the right lane while the emergency vehicle is in the left lane ideally otherwise we'll hurt yeah. you kindly if you're driving in england is it different no i think it's still the same um you just drive on the other side of the road you have some European listeners. Peter has made sure we're big in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs>